How we doing? Good to be uh, good to be back. Good to be free. <laughs> the word of God said all who uh, live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I expected that, but not where it came from or how it came. Let's, uh, let's pray really quickly before we get into the Word of God. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your spirit, for the, the privilege to gather and to worship you in this, a nation established, Father God, by our fathers for the glory of your name and the furtherance of the Christian faith in their words. And God, this is such a crucial freedom to to be able to gather and assemble and worship you. And we thank you for that, God. And we thank you for your spirit that we have felt in this place, God. We do everything we do to honor and glorify you. And let our eyes ever be set upon you. Let us see you. Thank you for your presence. I felt there when we were praying for my mother. We're not going to quit believing. Even if we have to get down on our hands and knees and crawl to get to that point where we reach out and touch your garment, we'll keep believing you, Father. Because one moment of your presence can heal. One touch of your garment can heal. And we'll keep reaching until we touch and keep petitioning you. And we thank you for your spirit. We ask you to anoint me that I glorify your name today and everything I say and you would help me and guide me in the things I say and help everybody here to hear and let this service go even as it has gone for the glory of your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Looking at the 19th and 20th verse. Paul the Apostle. I made sure not to uh, bring my water with me today. Keep that. (laughs) Abstain from the appearance of evil. Paul said this, verse 19 and 20. He's talking about the resurrection primarily. And addressing some who denied it, I suppose. I don't know, but uh, either way. These are inspired words. Paul said, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For those of you who don't know, I just spent <laughs> some time in a federal penitentiary for my involvement on what is the crime of the century, the great insurrection, January 6th. Um, I was talking to a guard in there when I was in there, and he was like, you guys didn't, that wasn't much of an insurrection <laughs> if it was. And I don't know where you all stand politically. I, I'm sorry. I don't want to offend anybody here but or, or turn you off, but they, they, I guess this topic is political in nature. But... He was like, if that was an insurrection, you guys did a pretty poor job. And I told him, I was like, nobody had arms, man. (laughs) The only time there was any violence that I saw was people using their arms. And the true patriot is figuratively a son of Patrick Henry. And he said, give me liberty, give me death. You don't show up with your bare hands if you're trying to overthrow the government. Just let that sink in. That narrative is trash. And it is a lie. It's fake news. Donald Trump's famous phrase. (laughs) Fake news. But the judge was seemingly merciful to me. He only sentenced me to two weeks in a federal penitentiary. I was only there for ten days because I had already served two law days in Columbus, Ohio. In a federal place up there. And when I showed up, because I wasn't vaccinated, and I would recommend you all do the same, whatever, do whatever you want, but 
There's been some crazy things going on in this world because of that nasty needle. Because I wasn't vaccinated, the first thing they did when I showed up, they were like, take off all your clothes. I stood in front of this big guy, <laughs> completely unclothed. Please don't use your imagination. And he checked every little part of my body. Touch your toes and cough. That's what he told me while he stood behind me. <laughs> and then they dressed me in orange. And uh, because I wasn't vaccinated, they put me in solitary confinement. I'm not exaggerating. For quarantine. They said I'd be there for five days. I was there by myself for seven days. All I had was a Bible, three meals a day, and just me and Jesus, really. But after seven days, they moved me down to another place. They called it the SHU, the segregated housing unit. And I had a cellmate. His name was Calvin. And I talked to him. He asked me why I was there. I was like, well, I went to a political rally, and uh, I guess I was kind of in the wrong place, wrong time, and explained to him my charges. And he was like, they put you in a federal penitentiary for a misdemeanor? <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> he uh, apparently had made quite a bit of money selling some pretty big-named drugs, like millions of dollars, and he could not believe I was there for what I was there for. For a little bit of perspective, we pled guilty to parading and demonstrating without a permit. The law enforcement literally let us in the building. I'm not trying to be rude or disrespectful to anybody. I love them and pray for them. I probably would not have gone any further than I went had I not lost the group I was with, the two I was with. We got to the steps. I, I had no idea anybody was even going to the Capitol that day. But... Before Mr. Trump, President Trump, got up to speak, we were there just mingling around the crowd. Somebody, we were buying a pretzel from a street vendor, and a guy walked up to us. I don't know if you've seen Ray Epps, but he looked just like him. Might have been him. I don't remember clear enough, but he was dressed. He had like a, looked like a bulletproof vest. He had a backpack on, had a red Trump hat, and looked like he was wearing just a military outfit. And he got our attention. He was like, we're going to the Capitol after this. You need to come with us. And we're like, okay. And I don't know that we determined to go there then, but we first learned about it then. And then Trump said in his speech, we're going to the Capitol to peacefully make our voice heard. So we went up there. And by the time we got up there, because we were about in the middle of the pack, you know, all hell on earth was breaking loose up there at that point. They were throwing uh, smoke grenades, and we got up there, and I was like, what is going on up here? Not ashamed I was there at the rally, not ashamed to protest what was obviously a, a heist, a theft. And the Spirit of God will tell you that, so will the fly on Mike Pence's head. But we got up there, and, and I just I didn't even know what was going on. It was like <laughs> just, just every, everything was breaking loose. And I lost the people that I was with. I panicked a little bit. I went up the steps to try to find them. There was nothing hope preventing me from going up the steps, even though there was before I got to that point, apparently, and obviously. But we got up there, and then we got up the steps onto the balcony of the Capitol building, and, and a young man came up to us, looked like he was a teenager, or in his young 20s. And he said, hey, the police are letting us in this door right here. <laughs> So we're like, okay, the police are letting us in. We walked up to the door, and the law enforcement was standing right there, like three or four cops lined up on my left and my right hand. And I have video of this. The very words they said were, we don't agree with this, just be respectful. We thought we were perfectly allowed to be there. We walked in, we walked around for 10, 15 minutes. Law enforcement supervised us in the building. Then at a certain point, um, things got a little chaotic in there. It was right when that young lady got shot. Ashley Babbitt was her name. And this police officer came running in a hallway behind us, and he, he found me and the two individuals I was with, which you know who they are, <laughs> I'm sure. But, and he said, if you guys don't leave right now, you're getting charged with trespassing. So naturally, we were like, okay. <laughs> Turned around and tried to get our way out of there which took a few minutes, but we made it out. But 
They came, arrested me a couple months later. And, I mean, when they say you're allowed in and then come and say, if you don't leave, you're going to be charged. You, you don't think you're doing anything wrong. And I was taking videos. I sent videos to my friends and, and things like that, thinking, you know, hey, this is pretty cool. I'm in the, in the United States Capitol. But I guess we were, we were committing the crime of the century, like they said. Pearl Harbor, my goodness. <laughs> the worst crime since the Civil War. They came arresting me, uh, charged me with per, er, violent entry, a few other things that were ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. This, the first case, they arrested me twice, in case you don't know, very sketchy. Arrested me under Elijah Yazdani, charged me with violent entry, a few other things that would have been felonies. And we, that case carried on for almost a year. And the reason why is once we got to the point of discovery, and I'm not trying to be rude, I love the judge, and I think he was kind of kind to me. He only gave me two weeks. Everybody else got like a month with similar charges. But like I said, for perspective, the ones, the parading and demonstrating charge traditionally is a $50 fine. When Brett Kavanaugh was being uh, interrogated by the committee, There were individuals on the other side in 2018, liberal, politically leaning, broke into the Capitol with signs, protested that hearing all about abortion. They all got a $50 fine and got sent home. I was charged with the same thing initially, eventually pled guilty to it. $500 fine, imprisonment, two years probation, Same thing. They got a $50 fine. (laughs) Where is Lady Justice (laughs) leaning? That's ridiculous. And thank God there were some very, very dear people in this church who stepped up and helped us get to the top of the cross of our chart. (laughs) But unbelievable. And we realized very quickly, because I was in this, like I said, for a year under those felonious charges, And we got to the point where evidence was to be brought out and the the prosecutor saw the evidence. And let me tell you, it it doesn't look good for them. (laughs) She saw how they let us in the building and she even admitted in court his mannerism was kind of mild. And they made a big deal about the GoPro that I had and they were trying to get my siblings who were there with me for tampering with evidence. And in my mind, I was like, please let that be evidence. (laughs) Please bring that GoPro up here, sir, because it will destroy everything they're saying. We never got there. But we got to the point of discovery. She saw it and realized they had nothing on me, so she kept delaying it, continuing it. The judge gave her 30 days, 60 days. And then when we were one day away from trial, I got a call from my public defender, and he said, there's a new warrant out for your arrest. You need to go turn yourself in at FBI headquarters in Columbus, Ohio. And this time they brought the two people that were there with me. This time they arrested me under my legal name, Lawami Yazdani. I go by Elijah Yazdani. My father wanted to name me Lawami. My mother said God said name him Elijah. They got in a fight over it. <laughs> I chose to go by her name, but I bear his name as well. Um, we went and turned ourselves in. They recharged me. The first case, mistrial completely. Should have been motion to dismiss, should have been dropped. But they brought it back, realizing she had nothing, did one of the sketchiest things I've ever seen. I talked to all the law enforcement there. They said they'd never seen it done before. Instead of re-evaluating that case or going through the trial, it just disappeared. (laughs) And next thing you know, I'm arrested as if I was never arrested before, again. And then we realized this ain't going to be fair. So we talked it over and... They presented a plea deal, and we were like, we'd better do this because the court is clearly not in our favor. We'd better plead just to try to control the damage they're going to do because they're going to do something. It's it's obvious. It's rigged. I love him. I pray for him. I think the judge was a nice guy, but very, very politically involved. So we pled guilty to parading and demonstrating without a permit, which if you read the law, I guess we did, even though they left us in the building. 
But for me, it came down to my hat. <laughs> because I didn't chant in the building. I didn't really do much, but I had a political hat on. And that's eventually what led to me being in line for that charge because they could twist that charge to where I, I was wearing a political hat. So they could convict me of that. So we pled guilty, not necessarily because I think we were, but because we realized this thing is, is on, you know, they are, they're wearing the referee jacket. They're going to do whatever they want. And all we can do is try to control what they do. And we pled guilty to the, to the one that offered the least amount of probation, the least amount of potential imprisonment. And thankfully, the two I was with didn't get imprisonment. But I went to jail, and after they told me to touch my toes and cough and dress me in orange and did all that, I was sitting there at, with my back against that cold rock wall in solitary. And the man that I ended up being a cellmate with said that if somebody murdered somebody, they would have put them exactly where I was, the shoe. He said, if they, I told him, well, I've, I've experienced prison now. He was like, no, you didn't experience prison. He's like, this is the shoe, man. This is the hole. <laughs> he was like, this is where they send the bad guys. <laughs> He was like, if somebody murdered somebody, they put them here where you are right now. He's like, in prison, you get to walk around and go out in the yard and stuff. And the reason they put me there, the dear lady, I was supposed to go to a camp. But the dear lady who was over the camp said she got a communication from the government before I showed up and said they weren't allowed to let me in the camp because I was a domestic threat. <laughs> so they put me in the shoe. <laughs> Solitary confinement. And thank God I was only for 10 days. But I hope, if nothing else, people can see we're not playing with, we're not dealing with anything fair here. This is, this is messed up. And it's not just me. And like I said, I got a mile compared to what some other people are getting. For wearing a hat <laughs> in a building, a, po- a political hat, they threw me in solitary confinement. And I was sitting there thinking... To myself, with my back against the that cell, I wish I did something to at least deserve this. <laughs> Those thoughts are going through my mind. Maybe I should have elbowed a Capitol policeman or something. If I was going to do 10 days in solitary, it sucks. I'm sorry if that's a bad expression. Not fun. I wish I would have at least done something to deserve it. If you got to go to jail and, and you're going to go to jail, I mean, go rob a store or something. <laughs> Do something worth it. <laughs> Get a diamond ring and wear it for six months. <laughs> but I was sitting there thinking that, and, and the only reading material I had per my request was a Bible, and it was, a, and it was NIV. I don't like the NIV, but... It was the Bible. (laughs) And sitting there thinking that, I came to this 15th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. And these verses jumped out of the page at me, even though not directly quotable to the King James Version. But the message is still there. And God can use the NIV, because he did there. (laughs) They took a lot of things out. I don't prefer it. I don't recommend it. But God can use it. He talked to it through a donkey one time. <laughs> he can use anything. And I tried my best to, to leave some, uh, some nice vandalism on the desk there. to <laughs> Some Jesus loves you and some crosses for the next guy coming in. But... Paul said, if in this life we have hope in Christ only, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And sitting there in that situation, I saw it. What he meant. (laughs) At least in the context of what I was going through. The same thought process. That maybe some may entertain and endure. Is it really worth it? (laughs) 
Many are the afflictions of the righteous. In this world you will have tribulation. All who live godly shall be persecuted. And in the middle of all that, in the middle of the the, the solitary confinement that serving God can find you in, not literally, the thought may come to mind, is it worth it? And if I was going to be treated like this in this life, I wish I did something to deserve it. If in this life only we, Paul details and isolates a select group, we, we have hope. We, we are of all men. So he separates somebody from everybody. We. And the we is we. <laughs> we. The child of God, the Christian, the follower of Jesus Christ who denied himself, taken up his cross. This is not an easy way. We're climbing uphill to get to heaven sometimes. He's God of the hills and the valleys. We have a cross to carry. And the devil has targeted us. We have a spiritual fight to fight. A fight of faith. This Christian life is not easy. The world hates us. The world despises Christianity and Jesus Christ. They don't mind other religions. They're tolerant with them. But come the way, the truth, and the life. They don't like him. And if we go through all of this and spend our days, our limited days and hours on earth with our back against a cold wall, with two thin blankets, no pillow, a little cot and a little mat, (laughs) your back hurts, you barely sleep, they come and shine a flashlight in your face every 30 minutes overnight. You got to use the restroom in front of the world. (laughs) You really do. There's no, I mean, there's nothing there. There's just a little toilet in the corner. And if you're, if you're doing well, if you're regular, as they say, you know, somebody's going to see you. <laughs> it's a, the whole thing's a locker room. But spiritually speaking, to go through all of that and there be no heaven. And there be no resurrection. What we are of all men most hopeless. We, speaking of the Christian, to live this hard life if there was no resurrection, if there was no heaven, worthless if hopeless. Some of the things some of us have gone through, no doubt the devil brought it against us and caused it. We would not have gone through it if we were not serving Jesus Christ. We went into a a figurative solitary confinement because of our association and relation to Jesus Christ. Before I go on, let me say this, though. (laughs) i got to make this clear. It is a hard life. Christianity, it is a hard life. And, and believe me, especially if you're a minister, I never knew some of the things I've known until I started trying to preach for God. Some of the battles, I never dealt with it. Never. This man, is, he's fighting hell for you guys. And I never knew it until I took up a cross and accepted a calling. But before I go on, let me make one thing clear to the world, to the, to the church, to anybody. That though this is a hard way, it is still the better way. (laughs) It is still the best life you could live. We are free. (laughs) The song says, if you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, (laughs) if you've been hearing the same old voice till the same old lies, If you've been trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. (laughs) There's a better life. (laughs) It may be hard, but this is the best thing going in this world. I'm not addicted to drugs. I'm not an alcoholic. (laughs) 
I'm not running around the world trying to have a one night stand with every woman I see. I am free. I am free. I am free in Jesus Christ. Whom the Son set free is free indeed. (laughs) This is the best life. The life of sin may have some pleasures, but it does not compare. I talk to God on a daily basis and He talks with me. They'll walk the same old road for miles and miles and never come to a point of anything. I've already arrived and I'm on the straight and narrow way. I'm going somewhere. (laughs) They'll hear the same old voice tell the same old lies. I listen to one voice, the voice of truth, even amidst all of the things the flesh could bring against my mind. The voice of truth. I have this book. They have no guide, no map with their own lusts. They're trying to fill the same old holes inside. I found satisfaction when I was eight years old. (laughs) I am free and I am filled and I am redeemed. I am satisfied. It's a hard life, but it's a better life. The devil advertises the pleasures of this world and there are pleasures in this world. But they don't compare to the joy in Jesus Christ. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. I was reading it when I was sitting back there. The Bible says tribulation, anguish upon the soul that does evil. But glory and honor and peace to those who do good. We may fight hell. We may have some battles. But this is the better life. And there is a better life of the two. And only we have it. Only we have it. But even so, we have the promise of heaven. We're not slaves to sin. We're not burdened down. We are free, but still, we are persecuted and we go through things that other people would not go through. And if there was not a heaven, if there was not an ultimate goal, if there was not a reason, it would be worthless. If we're just going to die, if we just live and die and nothing happens, what's the use of going through all this? We may get to live a life without addiction and, and get to not have to go through some of the things a sinner would go through. But if you're going out anyways, you might as well Eat and drink because you're going to die. If nothing happened but death, we, Paul said, of all men are most hopeless. Because we go through all of this and just die. There's no heaven, no reason to preach the gospel. Nobody's going anywhere. We're just going to die. You might as well go have some fun. (laughs) Even though it's not the better life, Neil and Eric could probably be playing music anywhere for the devil. They're so talented. But they'll play here in this church for God Almighty. They could be making a lot of money. (laughs) They're that good. But they play here for God for little to nothing and have to work a job. If there is no heaven, if there is no reward at the end of it all, that's a waste. But now is Christ risen from the dead. (laughs) And become the first fruits of them that slept. We ain't doing all this for nothing. We're not going through these hardships for nothing. If we had to endure trials or a figurative imprisonment, you would want to deserve it. But now is Christ risen from the dead. There is a heaven. (laughs) There is a heaven. There is a resurrection. I believe Billy, it was Billy Graham who told this story. There was a man who came up to him. I don't know if it was Billy Graham, but I've heard it from Billy Graham, I think. As a lot of people have heard a lot of things good from Billy Graham. He said a man came up to him one day, and uh, I believe he's an atheist, and he was kind of debating with him. 
And he said, Billy, if uh, he was telling him there's no God, there's no heaven, there's no hell, you know, he was basically saying, if in this life only we have hope, you are all, you are of all men most miserable to Billy Graham. And he said, Billy, what if you get to the end of the way? And there's no heaven, there's no hell, there's nothing. <laughs> he said, Billy, I don't believe there is a God. And the Spirit of God dropped a nugget of truth in Billy Graham's heart. And Billy told him, and I think it was him, he said, if there is no God, if there is no heaven, if there is no hell, when we get to the end of the way, he said, even though I could have enjoyed some things, he said, I will have lost nothing, and you will have lost everything. If there is no God, both lose nothing, really. You just die. We brought nothing into this world. We'll carry nothing out. But if there is a heaven, and if there is a hell, they have lost everything. And we have gained everything. Either way, we got nothing to lose. The book of Revelation chapter 19. I did not give this to Miss Jess. John said this. Verse 11. He said, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness doth he judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Incidentally, I was talking about one of the times I preached here about how the woman with the issue of blood reached out and touched Jesus. Now, Jesus is clothed in the Word in heaven, and that, this is how you touch him. It says right here, he had a name written on him. That no man knew but himself, wearing that name, a type of his word. The 14th verse, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp two-edged sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he shall tread the winepress and the, of the fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty. Oh, no, this, is, this is the verse right here. And he hath on his vesture his clothing, and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. In case you don't know, friend, we win. <laughs> it's written right there. We win. <laughs> we win. We win. <laughs> in, the, in the typology of the book of Revelation, when you're clothed in white, you went through everything and you won it. That's the garment of victory. Everybody who knows Jesus Christ truly and names his name and believes his name is going to be there with him. <laughs> the trump of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to be with him in the sky. And then sometime following that, this will occur. Jesus Christ is coming back. Jesus Christ is coming back to rule and to reign this world. If in this life we only have hope, we are of all men most hopeless. But Christ is risen from the dead. And he not only rose, he conquered every enemy. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And he's coming back to take over this world. And if you believe in him, you will rule and reign with him forever. We're not going through all this for nothing. Some of us do endure some tough things, especially if you're in ministry. 
But we are not going through any of this for nothing. And the Bible says the sufferings of this present time cannot, are not worthy to be compared to the joy that shall be revealed in us. Jesus rose from the dead. That tomb is still empty, but now is Christ risen from the dead. As I've said before, if, if corruption wants to win, they've got to get Jesus. You can handcuff me, put me away, and think you're keeping somebody from doing something to you. Good luck. It's not me you've got to worry about. He's going to ride on a white horse and do away with all evil. Unless you can put Jesus Christ back in that tomb, you're not going to get very far with evil in this world. He is risen from the dead. And He is Lord of all. And we win. <laughs> we win. We may have to go through some things. This is an evil world. We may have to suffer persecution. I didn't plan on being persecuted. Of all things, I wouldn't want to be persecuted for politics. But God encouraged me with that and let me know that it's about the gospel. It's all about the gospel. And that's the only reason I was there, really. I love President Trump. I know he was cheated out of that. But the freedom the devil wants and everything that he's planning in this nation is to take the freedom right here. From that man and from anybody who will stand up here. Or even on the street. There was a, I talked to a man, a good friend of mine, and I won't mention his name, but um, he was like, once he saw certain things happen in this world, he was like, man, you guys should have burned it down when you were up there. <laughs> After some of the things Biden has done, I was like, yeah, I didn't have any matches with me. <laughs> I wasn't, I mean... Good Lord. There was some pushing and shoving, some sumo wrestling going on there. But I don't think of it. You couldn't call that an insurrection if you wanted to. The police honestly started a lot of it. They, the crowd would, out, would be out there chanting. And, I mean, there's people that broke in the building. There's video of that. I didn't see it myself. But there's people literally that broke in the building. That's, I mean, the, 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 our founding documents say if the powers that reside in these institutions become corrupt... It's the duty of the people to overthrow them. Maybe my friend wasn't so wrong. <laughs> and maybe something like that needs to happen. I pray not. I have nothing but love for those people. I pray not. And I had no intention to harm anybody. If it came down to it, I mean, I mean, I wasn't anybody's hero. You know, I didn't go through what I went through because I deserved it. I didn't. I really did nothing. I mean, I, I don't I don't. I'm not trying to, to embellish the story because I didn't do anything. <laughs> I wasn't a hero. I, I just was kind of there protesting a, a, a crime that many, many troubles have come to this world through. The Lord revealed that to us. Not, not detail. I didn't know war was coming. I had dreams about war coming. But dreams about God telling me the, the things that are coming, not telling me exactly what if this guy gets in office, and he did. And look at the world now. <clears throat> I don't know the, the truth about Russia versus Ukraine. I don't think Russia's as evil as they say. You can get mad at me, but I don't want war anywhere. But all I know is that definitely wouldn't be happening if Mr. Trump was in there. <laughs> that guy don't mess around. He's the same guy that stood up there and said, Soleimani is dead. <laughs> Trust me, they wouldn't have messed with him. And he would have kept order and peace on earth, I believe. But we just pray for peace on earth, and we know Jesus is coming. The things we're seeing are probably directly from this book. But we win. I pray for our legislators. I don't hate them. I, I have no intent to harm anybody. But we win. We win. We're not going through anything we're going through. Not, not, I'm not speaking politically, I'm speaking spiritually. The things you guys endure on a daily basis are comparable to that because you could have the same thought. That I'm going through this for nothing. But there is a land of pure delight. There is a heaven. We're not on our way to hell. We're not on our way to hell. The loved ones that have gone on, we're going to meet them again. Because of this very thing for which we are troubled. The name of Jesus Christ. There is a resurrection. There is eternal life. Jesus didn't die. He, he died and rose from the grave. It's a complete story. 
And this time is going to pass. When Paul wrote those words, whenever he was feeling that, that was, I believe, 2,000 some years ago. Look how quickly it went for him. Troubles don't last. We got the best deal here and we got the best life. It is worth it. And the song says it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. We win. <laughs> we win. Let's, let's, let's ask the Lord to bless this inclusion. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We pray that you encourage us and anybody who may be thinking of this fight of faith at times is not worth it. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Not only do we have the first fruits, God, we are going to eat of the fruit and possess it. Lord, I just want to thank you that in this hopeless, depressing, discouraging, dark world, you cared about us and you gave us a hope. You could have forgotten about us. You could have left us here to die and go to hell. But you so loved us that you gave your son that we would not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you for that cup you drank of. Father, give us a new glimpse of heaven. <laughs> we, we will lay our heavy burdens down one of these days and we will be together forever with you. Give us a fresh glimpse of heaven, a fresh Glimpse of eternity. Put eternity in our eyes again. Let us fix our eyes on those things unseen, Father God, for we have an eternal hope. We thank you. We love you. Bless this congregation and this church and provide the needs, Lord, that Tammy was talking about. We thank you and we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good job. Oh, God is so good, isn't he? In spite of all the stuff we don't understand, God is good.